I have to apologize a little bit. You may hear some uh, some tree pruning in the background. There's a uh, there's a gardening crew across the road just going crazy in the next door's yard. So hopefully the sound is okay. Oh, Fergal, yeah, I guess it is nighttime for you there, isn't it? I just got up, so. Um, we, won't take, we won't take up too much of your time. <laughs> All right, look, why don't we get started, hey? Um, so my first question is, can everybody see my screen? Can everybody see the gray background and, and the, the pricing your joinery on your screen? Couple of thumbs up. Okay, sounds like everybody can see it. Okay, so I'll just I'll just sort of preface this and, and let you know how it's going to go. Um, Ingrid, uh, can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear, but I was muting myself because I've got bird noise in the background. <laughs> that's better. That's better than a chainsaw. Um, <laughs> can you hear the chainsaw in the background? No. Okay, good. Um, so anybody, this is Ingrid. She's my business manager and just an awesome person. Um, and with so many people in, in, a, in a webinar like this, we just like to have someone help us moderate. So if you ask a question and I miss it, uh, she'll interrupt me and tell me that, uh, yeah, there's someone asking a question. Um, so great to have you on board, Ingrid. Thanks for attending. You're welcome. Um, all right, so let's just jump into it. Um, the first thing I'll say is that there's many weird and wonderful ways to price joinery. Um, I'll introduce myself a little bit. I won't bore you with any of the details. If you really want to know, you can find out all kinds of things on, about me on social media. Um, I've been helping joinery businesses for over 20 years, actually close to 30 years now. <laughs> um, and uh, one thing for sure I find whenever I get on board and help someone is we've got some way of pricing our joinery. Um, and often it's some bizarre sort of spreadsheet that we've inherited from someone or that we built. Um, and oftentimes we don't really even know uh, how it works. In about 1997, so this is going back a few years, when I owned my last uh, kitchen cabinet manufacturing business, I was struggling with the same thing. We used to get um, too much, too much request to quote type things, um, and I was just overwhelmed. I was just in total overwhelm mode, and I used to take take some of the drawings and I go, okay, well. It's about fifteen thousand dollars, and I type it up fifteen grand and send the quote in and kind of pray. Well, you know, of course that doesn't work very well. So, and I did this because I really didn't have a system of, of pricing and quoting, and most of my quotes were uh, fairly inaccurate anyway. So I kind of thought, what you know, what the hell? I might as well just take a guess at it. Then I got a gentleman on board who is a consultant by the name of Norm Starling, and he taught me um, what we call cost cost plus pricing. Now. Norm was um, a little bit older, and an older guy taught Norm. So this isn't a new concept, right? This is something that's been around for quite a while. And what I like to do is I like to remove any doubt. I like to remove any of the gray areas when it comes down to pricing, because this is actually a really simple thing. Um, we make a simple thing complicated. So the, the intention of this uh, little brief webinar today is to just show you how simple pricing can be. Um, and it, it, can go, it can go in different directions, but it's actually a pretty simple thing. So here's a question for you. Everybody on the line right now, are you a night person? Are you a morning person? First difficult question for the day. Just type into the box, night person, morning person. Fergal's neither. William's a night person. Morning, morning, night, morning. Jan's a morning person. Clinton's a morning person. Ingrid depends on the day and <laughs> the part of the world. Corey's a morning person. Damien's a night person. Night person. That's really, really interesting. In this industry, we almost always get morning people, but um, Tim's neither. So Tim's a morning and a night person, or neither a night or a morning person. <laughs> um, I happen to be a night person, but we run these in the morning, so um, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Okay, so let's jump into this. I'll talk a little bit about business, but I won't talk very much. I, I think basically you have two, maybe three roles in your business. You want to attract the right people to you. So the more A-grade clients that you can attract to your, to your business, rather than having to go out and hunt them down, the better you'll be. You then have to learn how to convert those customers, those hot leads into paying customers. And then of course you need to deliver you know, your prompt, what you promised uh, impeccably, right? So attract, convert, and deliver. Those are really the primary goals in business. Um, and what we do really, really well as tradesmen, you know, most of you, I'm going to guess, are tradespeople that have gone into business. 
Um, what we do really well is we deliver because that's what we're trained to do. You know, we're trained cabinet makers or tradespeople of some kind, and we're we're not really taught too much about how to attract customers to us or even how to convert them into paying customers. Those concepts are a little bit foreign to a lot of us. So um, when we talk about pricing your work, it does actually have a little bit to do with the attract and convert side of things, not so much about the delivery. But the thing is, we're great at delivering, right? We love making great joinery. Um, and most of us feel pretty comfortable in the workshop. Like um, I still, after, you know, I'm 50, 51, I still feel more, more comfortable in the workshop than I do in the business environment generally speaking, because I am, a, I am a cabinet maker by trade and I have run my own businesses. So um, our nature as cabinet makers or as, or as tradesmen is to feel more comfortable in the delivery side of things. So it makes sense that we've got to learn a little bit about the attract and convert. So it makes sense that when we say, if we don't have a good system for quoting or pricing, um, it, it, it makes sense that if, if you're going to ask yourself, look, I'm going to spend days um, working on quotes, that freaks most people out. That, that makes a whole lot of sense because it isn't really part of our DNA. So um, a lot of times what happens is a lot of us sort of take a bit of a shot at the dartboard. We just kind of say, I think this is going to be the price. I reckon there's going to be, you know, uh, $500 worth of hardware and there's going to be about, you know, $800 worth of board and I'll chuck $1,500 worth of labor in here and there's the price. I don't know if that's how many of you quote, but if there's anything even remotely close to that, it's still a little bit of a guess. Um, and the problem with that obviously is you're playing around with the potential future of your business, the potential future that you're trying to create for yourself in this business. Um, you know, once the quote is submitted and accepted by the customer, it's set in stone. You can't go back and say, oh, sorry, you know, I didn't, I didn't allow for that uh, zebra stripe babinga from Africa that's another $2,000. I missed that. I've got to add $2,000 to your price. Customers can't go too bad, buddy. Like, that's, that's, that's it. So, so we've got to make sure we get it right. Um, and a lot of us look like this. You know, the results are I've got this big pile of quotes, and I'm not winning many of them. Um, and I need to get through another 20 just to win one or two. That's a really draining thing, and it's it has an effect uh, on all of us. Like I, I, I felt it myself. You know, we have this big pile of pile of quotes that we want to get through, and it's just if we don't have a good system that A will get us through it relatively quickly, and B when we do win the job, we have to know that that price is is going to make us profit, and um, and hopefully our factory can produce it. Um, interesting, you know, thing. I think a lot of us kind of re relate to this. You get almost this instant high when you win a job because it's it's euphoric, right? You've been working on this thing and you've actually won a job. There's this massive, massive hit of of euphoria. But then a lot of us often have this instant sort of, um, it, you know, an instant high and an instant low because now we're worried that we're not sure we're going to get the job done on time, even if we do get it. So it's an interesting industry. Um, but so, you know, those are, the, those are the things that I've kind of experienced. Um, I, I'd ask the group, is there anything else that you sort of experienced around your quoting that, that, that particularly bother you? And we'll, we'll just make some notes here to make sure I'm hitting the marks for you guys. Um, and just type, just type into the chat box, what is it about pricing that you particularly struggle with? Competitors undercutting? Okay, that's a marketing question. Variations of material costs? When it comes to... When it comes to more than just boxes, okay, that's a good question. Competitors on your cutting, that's something I'll cover in another webinar, but uh, um, your pricing still has to be enough so that it supports your business profit-wise, regardless of what your competitors are doing. Unclear specifications. Working out labor component, good question. Amount of time spent. I'm assuming, Darren, that you mean spent building the kitchen or time spent doing the actual quote? That's a question for Darren. Time quoting. Yeah, so it's got to be quick, um, but it's also got to be accurate. Um, time estimates, time quoting, yep, perfect. All right, so we've got um, labor. You know, what's the question around how do we, how do we know how much labor it's going to take to do it? Um, the one thing that I'll make really clear from the very beginning is that in order to run a really successful manufacturing business, and let's, let's be really, really clear about what you're doing. And I'll stand on my soapbox a little bit here for a second. 
in our industry, which is joinery manufacturing, cabinet manufacturing, shop fitting manufacturing, we are not contractors. And what we need to do is we need to get the builders on board um, and they're not gonna do it for us. We've gotta make sure that they know that we are not contractors. They are purchasing a manufactured product from us based on their specifications. And so in order to do that, you know, what we actually have to do is we have to get a little bit better at running our business as well. So we have to transition from thinking that we're a contractor into knowing that we're actually running a manufacturing business. And in every manufacturing business, we have uh, workstations and departments along that chain of production. So in joinery, we might have a station that might be about drawing. Um, some people call this tech, some people call it set out, some people call it other things, but let's just say that when you win the job, you've got to do a little bit more drawing after the remeasure. Um, we might have machining. Machining can be CNC, uh, panel saw, uh, um, beam saw, if you have a beam saw, um, and, and usually edge banding. So all of that sort of thing that deals with machines, I call that's a machine center. We might then have assembly. Um, oh, I apologize in advance about my bad writing. My writing is terrible to begin with, but when I'm talking and writing, it gets even worse. Um, you have assembly, and then we usually have prep and load. And I put install over here because it's not part of manufacturing, but it certainly has to be considered in your quoting. Um, so Jan says, yep, have I allowed enough for time, for my time quoting and designing? Cool, okay. So, so there are issues that we're bringing up, but here's something that really needs to be considered first before we worry too much about how efficient we can make our pricing system. We've really got to pay attention to your conversion rate because in most cases, it's not really a question about uh, how do I do more pricing? It's a question about how do I get more conversions from the ones that I am doing? So here's a question for everybody else in the group. Number one, what's your conversion rate? And number two, how would it change your business if you doubled your conversion rate? So if everybody could just take a crack at that, if you know your conversion rate, so in other words, if you worked on 10 quotes, how many would you win out of that 10? One in 10? Chris is saying 70 to 80, which is excellent. William is guessing about 50. We're only uh, seven out of 10, so it's about 70%. Uh, Darren's saying 20 to 30. So um, some of you have really high conversion rates. Some of you have what I would consider really low conversion rates. So those of you that have high conversion rates, um, obviously, you know, you can only get to 100% and then that's it, right? So um, we would want to shoot for 70 to 90% conversion rates. So and we, we do that through a really strong marketing strategy. Um, but uh, if you're down around 20, 30, 40, what, what's actually happening is you're spending a lot of time working on quotes that you're not gonna win anyway. So obviously that's a big problem. So we can cover that in another, in another um, webinar, how we solve that one. But I really have to draw the focus on the fact that if your conversion rates are low, uh, that's actually a bigger problem than quoting. So what we do is we sort of start out with, uh, and this is a broad overview, we, we have an approach to things that we call five ones. And you know, in order for your business to work really, really well, to have a system that works really well, you need to know you need to be really clear on, on at least four things. Who your ideal client is, so that when you're quoting, it's attractive to them, and, and the things that you're great at, hopefully that's what this ideal client actually wants and needs. Um, if what you're great at isn't what your ideal client wants, then we've got a bigger problem. Um, we should have a marketing strategy that attracts you know, perfect clients to you, and then a conversion strategy which will pay them into, you know, convert them into paying clients. One of the problems that a lot of people have is that they try and sell right up here before there's even uh, an identification of whether this is the ideal client or not. So in other words, if you're, doing, if you're doing this, if you're getting an email from someone saying, hey, I've got a job, would you like to price it? You go, sure, send me the email. They send you the drawing, you price it up and you send your quote back to them, your conversion rates are probably gonna be fairly low. So we've actually got to build a relationship and go through a bit of a process to determine are they the right person, are they not, can we do what they want, and then eventually get to pricing here where uh, you built that relationship value and trust and your conversion rates automatically go up. Okay, so that's not really what this webinar is about, but I touched on a little bit. Um, I'd like to introduce you to someone who has implemented what I'm about to show you and has had a massive turnaround in their business because of it. 
This is a client of mine by the name of Chris from Curb Living. He's here in Melbourne. Um, relatively small business, didn't have any CNC machines or anything like that on board, um, but we're working towards that. Um, but we definitely had some internal struggles in the business as far as um, profitability and flow and, and you know pricing. Now, now Chris is like a lot of businesses, really, really great guy, really great business, and actually fantastic customers. Um, but he'd used uh, uh, linear meter pricing. Now, here's the problem with linear meter pricing. If anybody uses linear meter, meter pricing, just type into the chat box, yes, I do, or something like that. I'd like to know how many of you are actually using linear meter pricing. Um, so the problem with linear meter pricing is that uh, it doesn't connect to your business costs. It doesn't connect to uh, the increasing costs of your suppliers, uh, you know, putting increased prices onto you. It doesn't connect to anything that keeps you competitive as time goes on. So uh, obviously what happens with, the, with Chris and like any business like his that uses linear meter pricing, um, your suppliers costs go up. So let's say that whiteboard cost goes up. Often linear meter pricing doesn't change. Um, so slowly, slowly but surely, your, your competitiveness decreases because your profit margins start eroding. And then what happens is people start to get a little bit more desperate in their pricing. So whatever the linear meter pricing ended up being, like let's say it's you know $10,000, because work is getting a little bit more sparse and maybe the profits aren't there, we start cutting our, our margin even more. So, so it creates a downward spiral in business um, so what we really need to do is we need to connect your pricing directly to your costs in business. And that way, when your costs go up or even down, uh, your pricing will always be directly connected to that and it will be reflected in your price. So with Chris, we, had, we actually had a massive turnaround in his business. We went from, um, you know, let's say not a great net profit position up to a very, very healthy net profit position. And... Uh, Chris is a really, really great guy to work with, and he's now sort of um, saying, you know, he's got a tremendous amount of confidence that this business is going to create the future that he wanted for him and his wife and his kids. And, you know, all the hard work, the sweat and the tears that he's putting in, he can now finally feel like it's going to pay off um, because, the, you know, the pricing is actually getting him what he needs. There are other issues, as there always are in businesses, but, but this one certainly did have uh, a massive effect. Um, just simply by implementing the, you know, the new, a new pricing system. So next question for everyone in the group. You actually only have three cost areas in your business, three things at the highest level that we're going to put into categories that, you, that um, you spend money on in business. Can anybody take a guess at what they are? <laughs> How are we doing, Ingrid? We're doing great and um, thank you everyone for being so communicative in the chat box. And um, yeah, I just noticed Chris had said earlier that he couldn't see all the messages in the chat. So Chris, I'm not sure why that is, but you should be able to see them. And if not, I'll fill you in later. Yep. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, we should, I'm not sure if there's a setting. When people type in, they can probably choose all or private, I think, is what it is. Um, so it's, it's actually all panelists you need to be looking at. So yeah. All it, yeah. Yeah, so I think there's a choice there. Okay, so somebody said labor, materials, and overheads. That's it. Nailed it. Those are the three areas of your business. If anybody can come up with anything else in your business, um, I'm all ears. I'm all ears. Um, now, of course, what does come up, is uh, we've got subcontract. So we've got someone that might do some electrical work for you or some tiling work for you. I put those into a material because quite often it's a singular line item that you're gonna add into your, your, your quoting. So it's not labor and it's not overhead, but it could be just like buying a material, just like buying something else. Um, so if we're all on the same page that we've got labor, uh, materials and overhead, those are it, that's it. That's the only three things you have in business. It then makes sense to say, when we do our quote, if we're able to know that our cost of labor, our cost of materials, and our cost of overhead is known and identified, um, and we mark up from there, then we should then be able to make the profit that we marked up. So I'll just state at this point here as well that uh, there's a lot of confusion often in wording, uh, markup and margin. What I'd encourage everyone to think about is, is 
uh, forget about margin. Margin is only a measurement of what you what you um, charged for something and what it cost you. That's that's really what margin is. It's it's kind of irrelevant in many ways. What we want to talk about is markup from cost. So another conversation that comes comes out quite often is what's my labor charge out rate in my factory, or what's my labor charge out rate on my CNC machine. That that conversation I hear quite a bit. Uh, my response is always the same. It's actually totally irrelevant because if you stay clearly focused on what it is you sell, which is your joinery project at the end, the kitchen, um, whatever it is that you're actually selling, that's the only thing that you need to know what your sell price is. It's the, it's the final product that someone's buying from you. The only thing that you need to know about what's going on in your factory is what it's costing you. So, we want to work out what labor, materials, and overhead is on each job so that we know that they're covered and we can mark up from there. So here's what I've learned over the years. I've looked at, I don't know, maybe close to a thousand joinery businesses. Might be overstating a little bit, but it sure feels like it. And the one thing that I know for certain is that when we look at profit and loss in joinery businesses, there's one line item. Uh, that tends to be the most consistent right across the board month to month to month to month and That line item is your materials So we quite often see your materials being a very consistent ratio against Revenue and in this case here. This is actually a profit and loss um, It's this one's 44% so once we start seeing 44 45 46 percent of materials against revenue we start to get a little bit worried because it's creeping up. We want to be down around the 40 mark. So, you know, and I've, I've often thought about this. Why is that the most consistent line item in our profit loss? Well, really, it makes a whole lot of sense because if any one of you are cabinet makers by trade and you're running a business and you're asked to quote a job, you can probably look at a job and within about five or 10 minutes know within a very close degree of certainty what are the materials in that job to be used. So. Um, by the way of how our brain works, we almost always get materials and supplies right. It, you know, so it makes sense that when I'm dealing with people in this industry uh, and I see the materials against revenue ratio to be always very consistent and accurate, uh, it makes sense that it's that way. Where it blows out is the labor ratio. So, so if we look at this uh, wages for production labor, um, this one here is 20 20% which is getting close to where we want it to be this particular client was up around the 35 when I first started working for them And within a year we got their labor ratio down to around 20 But in most cases if you look at this month to month, this is the one that fluctuates up and down wildly because um, You know, we're chucking overtime at stuff or we didn't get it right in the first place um, so the point I'm making here is I wouldn't ever use uh, labor as something I could use for a mathematical calculation but we are going to use your material percentage as something we're going to use to calculate your overhead. So with that in mind, I'm actually going to jump right into here is the magic. Here's the magic for you. Um, and I've made this quite simple. So please keep in mind that you can put this in many different forms in many different ways. But I'll run through a, a, a scenario for you here. Um, and I'll just show you how this works. But I'll just stop for a second. Does anybody have any questions or comments about what I've just gone through? Seems like everybody's good. All right, so I'm going to plug in a scenario here for you, and we'll just, you'll see how it comes out in the end, and it should make a fair bit of sense. But I will warn you that this concept for some people that I work with is really quite different to how you're pricing now. Um, and it might take a little bit for this to wash over you. So if you don't get it in this little uh, video, in this little uh, webinar, don't worry about it because it'll, it'll come to you in the, in the up and coming days. And feel free to contact me at any point because um, I'm more than happy to give you this formula. All right, so if we were to say that this month's projected revenue was $100,000, and you know, let's be honest, you should know what revenue you're gonna be doing in the next month. Most people are confident enough to say, right, we've got work booked into this month and it's this much. All right, so, so let's just say that you had $100,000 worth of projected work in the coming month. And let's just say that we had worked out our materials percentage against revenue at 40%. Let's just say that that's what our P&L told us 
that our uh, material, consistently our materials against revenue was as a percentage. Those are the first two things we need to know. And those are things that the business will tell us. Every single thing I'm showing you here is not a guess. It is exactly what the business is telling you. So at the end of this, what you're going to have is a system that if everything worked the way that it looked on the screen, uh, your business would have no choice but to make the profit that we put on it. Uh, there'd be no choice because we've just said that if, if all three of those cost areas were covered uh, and you mark up from those costs, then that, that percentage is what your business would make. Right, so we know that you're going to make $100,000 this month in revenue. We know that your materials against revenue percentage is 40%. The next thing we want to do is we want to calculate what your actual overhead costs are on a month-by-month -month basis. And we would do this by working with you to go through your P&L, maybe work with your bookkeeper, your accountant, and come up with an actual hard figure for what your monthly overhead costs are. But let's just say, for example, your monthly overhead costs were $10,000. So the question is, in your quoting system, how can we put enough meat on the bone so that $10,000 every single month is covered? It actually comes down to a simple mathematical formula. We know that you've got $10,000 in overheads, and we know that 40% of your revenue is gonna to go towards materials, right? So that's $40,000. Now we just simply have to look at this and say, what do we need to do with 40,000 to get the $10,000 in overhead costs we know we need to cover? And we just simply divide your overhead into um, what you're gonna pay for material, and in this case, we come up with 25%. So in other words, Whenever you buy materials throughout the month, job by job by job, line by line by line, you're gonna be paying something for them, and that is going to add up to $40,000 throughout the month. And if we add 25% onto each one of those lines, uh, items of materials that you're gonna buy, we will get our $10,000 in overheads covered. So that, um, that percentage essentially becomes the next markup item that we put in before we think about profit. So what we're doing here is we're saying if you have a material takeoff list, which most people do, um, and we say, well, what's the board, what's the doors, what's the color board, and this list here will be you know, usually fairly extensive, um, and you know the quantity of those and the cost that you're gonna be paying for each one of those. And then if you mark that up 25%, you will then cover your overhead costs. And then after that, then you can go and mark up for profit. So the first markup is overhead. Now your third, material, your third business cost is covered. And then you've got your profit here. This is essentially what you would charge for this item, but not really. What I do is I keep labor out of this because as a mathematical calculation, we know that your labor is gonna be wrong, um, but labor is down here. And all we do is we, we split your labor into the different workstations. And we say, how many hours to do this? How many hours to do that? And then we have a cost. So cost on labor is not what you would need to charge if that employee went out. That is what you're paying people in that department in general. So <clears throat> people in your machining department or people in your paint department or assemblers, what do you generally pay them per hour? And then we can work out, again, maybe with your accountant or your bookkeeper, what what are the actual labor costs in your business, such as superannuation, insurance, um, holiday pay, you know, all those things that are associated with, um, with labor. So, so then what happens is we go through your profit and loss and we're ticking off each line, line by line by line, to make sure that every single cost area of your business is going to be covered, missing nothing. And then when you go through your pricing, everything will come out in the wash. So that's the simple formula. Um, the hard part is knowing what labor, or sorry, what materials you're gonna be using, what the labor is. So I don't have time today to go through that, but we'll do that in another webinar. There is a, there is a, a very secret formula <laughs> that I'll share with you for free on how to come up with these, but I'm willing to bet that most of you are going to know what your material is fairly, uh, fairly easily. But the one thing I can tell you is that if you are breaking out your labor into the workstations, like I'm showing you here, and then you take your workstations like this and then send this to the people that are doing the work. So in other words, in machining, we've got four hours to do this task. In paint, we've got four hours to do this task. 
there is a um, there's a little thing in the world called um, uh, Parkinson's law. Has anybody heard of Parkinson's law? Just type into the box if you've heard it. Very very curious if anybody's heard this theory. William says no. No. Fergus heard it because she's he's been on one of my other webinars. Damien says no. So when we're when we're finished here, maybe write it down and type in Parkinson's law, and you can do a little bit of research on your own. Parkinson's law works like this. Work will expand to fill the space given to it. I'll explain this a little bit further. Um, a tube of toothpaste. When you first get the tube of toothpaste, you use the first three quarters of that tube 10 times faster than the last quarter of the tube. Um, another mildly crude example is toilet paper. If you're sitting down and you've got two sheets of toilet paper left, you ran through the first whatever really quickly, now, now you've got two. Something happens really interestingly when you get down to that last two. You get really creative with what you're gonna do and you get really frugal <laughs> really quickly. Um, so Parkinson's law kind of works like this. If, if your workers have no idea how long it takes them to do a task, the same task given to them over the, over the week, um, if you give the same task to them 10 times with no parameters of how long it should take them, uh, let's say it should take them four hours, one time it's gonna take them six, the next time it might take them three, the next time it might take them 10 hours. So if you're not actually controlling uh, your, your workstations and telling them what's the parameter, uh, how long should it take them to do this, their times will fluctuate, that's human nature, that's what happens. So at the very, very least, even if your labor times here are wrong, if you give them the labor time that you have allowed in your quote, they will then at least know, and then they can record how long it took them. So here's the kicker. If you collect that record and then make some adjustments to how you're quoting, so let's say machining here is four hours, in this quote example I'm giving you, and it actually should be six hours, you need to know that. And, and in most cases, it's not because they're working too slow. It's probably because you didn't allow enough time. That's, that's the bad news for you. Um, so in most cases, it's just simply that we're not accurate enough with our labor times, and usually they're too low. Um, so if you tell them how much time that they should have, and they know that parameter, they're gonna be more likely to stay within the times that you've allowed in your quote. So I'll, I'll just take a pause again and open the, open the floor up for questions. And does anybody have any question about what I've shown you here on the screen? Questions or comments? And I am uh, more than, willing to have, uh, have the whole thing picked apart. But as of yet, after 20 or 25 years, we have yet to find a flaw. Um, and as long as I'm having clients like Chris and everybody else getting the massive return and seeing the results in your business, we think that this system you know, works pretty well. It certainly worked well in my business. Um, certainly when Norm taught me how to do this, I went from about a 3% net profit on average per month and we jumped up to about 18% net profit within about three months. Um, so it was a pretty massive turnaround for my business many years ago, and it's been the same thing for a lot of clients of mine. What if you don't have employees? Good question. It doesn't matter actually, because you should be using the same theory. You know, you're gonna allow a certain amount of time in each one of those areas. And I'm assuming that if, what if you don't have an employee, just me and hubby? But certainly you're working in the business as an employee, in the role as an employee. If you were just the business owner, you wouldn't be doing anything in the business. So your business in that case would be a profitable investment or an investment that everybody else that you employ is doing things. So as long as you are actually doing things in the business, you're filling the roles of an employee in that role. So you have to approach it exactly the same way. And if your charge out rates are the same as if an employee was in that position, uh, then this whole theory is exactly the same. How do you deal with people doing many different tasks at once? Well, many different tasks shouldn't be happening. You should have people that are in machining department and paint departments. Um, so we assign roles to people. So that's why we have an assembly department or a machining department. Um, obviously you can't be all things to all people. That's, a, you know, it's a, it's a statement a lot of people make. So, um, I think if you, you know, the, the most successful clients I work with are the ones that have, um, 
a very low percentage, and this is probably going to freak a few people out, but a very low percentage of tradespeople in their business. Because let's face it, we're manufacturing a product that's not that complicated. Um, having a tradesman add an edge banter, probably not needed. Having a, a tradesman putting square boxes together, probably not that important. Only have your tradespeople where they're required, not doing the mundane tasks that you could pay a semi-skilled worker to do. And once you start segmenting your business into defined tasks that a semi-skilled worker can do and using only the, the highly skilled tradespeople to do what only they can do, it starts to become very limited in that, what do we need a tradesman to do? So when we talk about many different people doing tasks at once, we have to look at your business and segment it into what makes sense. Um, hopefully that made some sense, William, but we have another talk. Uh, you know, feel free to contact me and I can explain a little bit further. Um, <clears throat> so this is a spreadsheet that um, my clients get and essentially it works in an automated way. Um, we, we can set up rooms and we can set up whatever else. But um, what a lot of people do is they'll put their, whatever all their materials are that they would buy in this column here. That would be a fairly exhaustive list. And then all they're doing is they're putting quantities here for, against the items for that job that's gonna happen. So uh, the other thing that I will state is that this is a, obviously it's a really basic way of pricing, but it's a very accurate way of pricing too. If any of you move into drawing packages, such as cabinet vision, where you draw the job first and then use the bid center for pricing, uh, it will use this exact same theory to come up with a price. Uh, its calculations might be slightly different, but, but the theory is exactly the same. It wants to know what your materials are, so if you draw it, it knows exactly what the bill of materials is. Um, and we then set up the bid center for labor against the different assemblies that are being made. So it's basically this same formula on steroids. So whatever you do, this, this formula is, uh, it's a stock standard formula for manufacturing because once you know your costs and you mark up from there, your business actually has no choice but to make that profit that you've marked up. So um, from this stage forward, I'm wondering, what did you guys take away from what I just talked to you about and what might you want to action in your business right now? Chuck a few things at me here. I'm interested to hear, did we move you forward at all? What, what if anything that I just went through was a little bit, a uh, bit of an eye opener for you? How about you, Ingrid? Was that an eye opener? It was an eye opener for me. I am. Um, just seeing uh, if you're I, awake. <laughs> I'm awake. I am honestly awake. <laughs> Um, one of the reasons I did this, um, this webinar for you guys is in the group and in, in many groups, um, this question comes up a lot. How do I price my journey? And I just, I see so many, so many things, uh, thrown around that I wanted to just make sure that I could, I could put out there a simple system. Um, can I tell you that the most difficult thing for me in implementing this with a new client is because it seems so simple, because it seems so basic and simple, most people think that it won't work because it's not complicated enough. <laughs> and, and that's the, actually the biggest hurdle. Um, but I've actually implemented this system in businesses that are eight, nine, ten million dollars. And most of those businesses were using a linear meter system um, and failing you know, profit-wise. So we've gone backwards and just implemented a simple system and it's taken them over the next hurdle. Um, but it, it's, often, it's often a struggle because it seems so simple. Uh, so yeah, I've been thinking about tracking hours to jobs and tasks. Going to go ahead with it. Cool. I'm going to be checking my labor materials and percentage on the profit and loss statements. Fantastic. Absolutely. So all you need to do is do a little bit of homework and figure out what your profit and loss is saying to you and figure out what this number is on a relatively consistent basis. Don't look at just one month. Look at it over the course of four or five or six months. Hopefully you're going to come up with about a 40% against materials, uh, Bironi, and that's, that's really what we're shooting for. 40 to 45 is, is acceptable. So if anybody wants any more information um, around this topic, if I didn't cover enough for you or if we went too fast, um, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm more than happy to expand this and even, even share some of these ideas with you. Um, Jan says, I like the sound of asking staff how long they think it takes to build Job versus my idea. Jen, that's a great idea. You can ask them. 
and then you get a consensus and then that what's, that's what goes into your quote. Um, so certainly if they have buy-in from the very beginning and you're saying it should take you four hours to do this and they've already agreed to that, um, how can they argue, right? So um, definitely getting them on board is the way to go. If not, they need to be aware that the hours you're giving them may not be accurate. And we just need, need to know how long it took them so that we can get them accurate. Um, Damien, most definitely the need to make sure I'm covering my overheads correctly and look at the profit on materials as normally I don't pay much attention. Yeah, um, Damien, you're right. The one thing that cabinet makers in this industry that I've, I've found miss is how do we calculate our overhead? Um, I was online with a client yesterday that said, um, well, I kind of work out what my costs are, materials and labor, and I just mark up 25%. Why aren't I making any money? The answer is really obvious. Your overheads are killing you. So um, should I add any extra, should I add extra for downtime, like going back to jobs or defected items from supplier? Uh, that's from Bioni. So that's a great question. Should you add any extra? <clears throat> Interesting question. I'll answer it this way. If you plan for 80% to happen, in other words, 20% of the stuff that shouldn't happen is happening, if you actually plan for that to happen, it's gonna to continue to happen. Um, what, what I'm all about is plan for 100%, and when the little defects or errors in your process occur, make sure that you're doing something about them so they don't occur again. Otherwise, what you've just said is having to go back extra times um, or a defected item from a supplier, if we are accepting defects from a supplier, they become our defects. So maybe what we need to do is put a, a better quality check on receiving from your supplier. Um, if there's extras for downtime, like going back to the job, maybe what we need to do is put a, a higher check in place for making sure it's 100% to complete the job. So um, if it's something that's hurting your business, then I definitely would add a line item um, in your quote. So when you add a line item, Add it, add it here like this. Don't, the biggest message I'm trying to make here is don't try and fudge one of the other things. Add a line item here that is extra for something and then just put a total amount to it like $500 or $1,000. Um, in the same vein that if you have a customer that's just a pain in the ass, put a PETA factor in here and then make it $1,500 or whatever it is. Keep everything separate so you know, I've added $1,500 because I think this customer is gonna be a real pain, and I'll just chuck another $1,500 in here to account for it. So, uh, Brioni, um, to answer your question, I, I would put extra in if it's hurting your business, but it's not something that you wanna leave in there because it's taking away your competitive advantage also. Um, if you put it in there and you win the price, it'd be better if it wasn't there and you get the same price, then you make more profit. So. Um, hope that hopefully that answers your question. Pain in the ass factor, yeah, it should be in there and it should be a separate line item for a lot of a lot of customers. No worries. Um, any other questions from anyone? Eighty <laughs> percent. That's good. <laughs> um, that's great. So everybody's been wildly interactive, which is great. Uh, hopefully, I've been able to explain this in a way that sort of hits home. But often, it takes a little bit of thought to wash over you. Um, again, feel free to contact me whenever you want. We're going to wrap up. If anybody has any other questions, chuck them in the box now. Ingrid, did you have anything you wanted to add? You work with a lot of my clients. Well, in fact, all of my clients. Could you add anything to this um, that you've seen some of the journeys that they've gone on with, with pricing? I think we've lost Ingrid. Oh, no, sorry. I there you I are. <laughs> I was talking to myself, obviously. I can um, hear you, but I couldn't hear you. No, I didn't have anything extra to add, but I did want to just say, do you want me to pop your email address into the chat window for everybody if they need to contact you? Um, yeah, it's not, I mean, this isn't really a, a sales pitch, but um, yeah, actually, go ahead and do that. Yeah, put my, my email address in there. Feel free to check me an email. Yeah, I'm more than willing to answer questions in an email back and forth a little bit. Um, yeah, anything I can do to help, more than happy to do. I'm really, I'm all about helping this industry and to be really, really blunt and frank with everyone, um, my goal is to get everybody up to the next level and, and we need to take ourselves a whole lot more seriously. Um, one of the things that's killing us in this industry is builders, putting us into contractor category and stretching our payments out to 30, 60, 90 days. 
One thing that you've got to really realize is that these same builders are buying joinery from China right now and paying 100% upfront for this joinery and waiting three or four or five months for it to get here. So any of these builders that are saying, well, I, you know, I won't give you your deposit or I won't pay your delivery fees, it's total BS because those same guys think they get a great deal from the, from the overseas stuff and they're paying 100% for it up front. So you need to, in many cases, if you're not getting paid on time and they're stretching you out, you just simply need to get a little bit more serious with how you're uh, setting up your contract. This is another area that we make great progress because cash flow can kill a business and it's all about cash flow. Um, if we're being compared to the chippy or the plumber on site who carries around a scrubby old toolbox and runs around in a, in a little ute, as opposed to you who probably has a couple of million dollars worth of machinery and have been you know, manufacturing product for the last two or three months, there is no comparison. One's a contractor and one's a manufacturing business. So um, yeah, we've got to get serious and, and sometimes it just takes changing the relationship with the client to say, look, I've got to get paid earlier. Simple as that, otherwise I can't run a sustainable business. That being said, I hope everybody had a good time. I had a good time. Thanks for participating. Um, there's a million other things we can do, and we'll, we'll do a few more of these, no doubt. Um, we had a great turnout, which is, which is good to see. It looks like the group is quite active and vibrant. So, um, yeah, have a great day, everyone, and, and uh, look, excuse me, look forward to talking to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, guys. That was a lot of fun. Chat to you again soon. Have a great day. Thanks, Ingrid. See you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>